Welcome back to Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Also heard on the radio in Las Vegas on KDON 101.5 FM, as well as 98.5 HD2, the Bet Las Vegas. Hello to our Vegas audience for joining us as well. Scott Branson, Mo Moten with you. We're here to talk Raiders football. The Raiders, of course, getting set to take on the Baltimore Ravens in a tough road game. The Raiders heading in 0-1 after losing to the Chargers last week. 22 to 10, a disappointing loss for the Raiders. Uh, bring in my good friend and my partner here, Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also columnist covering the Raiders at sportsnot.com. You can also catch him on TNT TV, True TV, you name it. He's around. Mo, uh, here we are. We're, we're gearing up towards this Baltimore game. And as I've said in conversations with people who listen to our show, uh, if the Raiders go out to Baltimore, they're they're nine and a half point underdogs. And I think that line's about right. And I, I just want to see improvement out of this team. We talked about it on Tuesday's show, just saying, look, if they don't win, there's no moral victories. That's correct. But you want to see this team improve. You want to see some inventiveness on, on offense, uh, some aggressiveness on offense. You want to see the defense uh, at least try to be able to go four quarters. And we're going to talk about a problem with the defense. But they also have to stop the run and Lamar Jackson from running particularly. So it's going to be an interesting challenge. Uh, how much for you will this game start to solidify a little bit? It's only game two, but to solidify sort of what the Raiders could be and what they're not in 2024. Even after this week, still a small sample size, but I think you'll you'll find out right away uh, how how good or how how good this team could be or just how far behind they are from the AFC contenders going up against the Ravens who are, who had extra time to prepare for this matchup. So you talked about Lamar Jackson, mobile quarterback, Derek Henry, big running back. So it'll test the Raiders uh, run defense. And let's say they gave up 200 yards. Uh, then you have a huge problem because the you know, other team is going to use that, that, that blueprint to attack the Raiders interior, their, the interior of their defensive line. Now, if they keep it close against the Ravens, and I said this on the last show, that even if the Raiders lose, but let's say they score 20 points, there's mm -hmm. hope for optimism going forward because you, you go up against a playoff contender, a perennial playoff contender, and you put up you know, 20 points, four touchdowns, uh, then, then you can look ahead and say, okay, we got the home opener against the Panthers. You should be able to – you should be favored in that game. You should be able to score points and build some momentum going into October. Yeah, sort of if they can get through this game a little bit unscathed, and of course you want the team, we're going to talk about injuries here in a second, but you want them to be able to get through this game. Yeah, have a chance to win it, of course. You don't go in thinking you're going to lose. It's just the odds are not in their favor. So if they can go out there, perform better, get some confidence, right, especially on the offensive side of the ball, and come out of there feeling good about yourselves coming home against a terrible, terrible Carolina Panthers team with Bryce Young at quarterback who just can't seem to find it, whether it's him or it's the situation or both together. It just hasn't worked out so far for Bryce Young. So they have that coming up on the horizon. But we talked about the defense and the defense playing really great for three quarters eh, into the fourth quarter against the Chargers. Of course, Malcolm Kuntz out knee injury. Tyree, in Tyree Wilson out knee injury. Um, and behind him, not much else. So the Raiders reportedly have signed uh, um, uh, Kalevion Chasen, right? Former first round pick, uh, from the, the, in 2020, 20th overall pick actually in, uh, Jacksonville for the Jaguars. This is a guy, you know, this is a guy that, uh, clearly didn't work out there in Jacksonville. So the Raiders are taking a, a, a flyer on him saying, hopefully they strike some gold in a change of address. We'll do Chasen some good. Are you surprised by this signing? We talked about maybe some of the other big names, they come with bigger price tags. Here they go with a guy who might be looking to prove something that's not going to cost them a lot. But is this a guy, Mo, that can come in and actually make a difference in light of the injuries they faced at Edge? I would say no. Uh, 
it, it's a depth signing. Um, Cleveland Chase Young was uh, 20th overall pick in the 2020 draft, I believe, as you just said. Jacksonville Jaguars had a little time with the Carolina Panthers, but hasn't really done much <laughs> since he's come into the league. <laughs> so I'm not expecting the guy to turn into a Pro Bowl or a full player with the with the Raiders defensive line. By the way, the Raiders have had Janaris Robinson over the past year after he was let go by the Vikings. Charles Snowden was on the field a lot last week against the Chargers. Those guys are clearly ahead of him on the depth chart, and they'll get most of the snaps on the edge opposite Max Crosby. But if you're looking at, at Chase on an athletic edge guy and you're going up against Lamar Jackson and you want to contain Lamar Jackson and keep him in the pocket and not allow him to escape on the outside, maybe he can help you in that regard because he does have the athleticism. But other than that, I, you know, he's going to get the cleanup snaps on the edge. And it's going to be all about, as I said, Charles Snowden and Janarius Robinson. Well, and Mo, you said during the offseason, I can I can hear it ringing in my head that, you know, hey, the Raiders might need to they might do something. They might go get somebody else at edge, because even though Malcolm Kuntz, people were happy with his performance last year, he was expected to take another jump this year. Uh, and of course, they addressed a little bit of the inside of Christian Wilkins and Christian Wilkins overall, I believe, had a pretty good game against the Chargers, showed his athleticism, even dropping into coverage. Right. This guy is a good player. Uh, but now you're in a position where you're down two guys on edge. And like you said, you're counting on Robinson and Snowden to kind of take those reps. Uh, but that's clearly not what the Raiders plan was. How much of an issue is this going to be for them? We were talking. We don't know about Tyree Wilson yet. As far as his long-term prognosis, we do know clearly with Malcolm Kuntz, it's four weeks. So, you know, you're talking now being into the fourth week. If Tyree Wilson's out for multiple weeks, how much of an issue does this become? Because then Max Crosby's going to get doubled and they're not going to have that second punch on the other side. Well, as far as the pass rush is concerned, this is where Christian Wilkins could step up and be, be a presence on the interior to help out, help out Max Crosby. But it, there's only so much you can do. Uh, a lot of Raider fans wanted the wanted Tom Telesco to sign Yannick Ngakwe. I said it on the show on on Tuesday that I didn't think that Tom Telesco was going to spend the money in season on patchworking the defensive line with the best edge rusher available. And a lot of fans say, "Look, that's not all about winning." But that's just not who Tom Telesco has been. He'll spend money on surefire starters. I mean, season long starters. But right. when it comes to patching up holes or having a short-term guy come in for three to four weeks he wasn't going to drop big bucks on on a, on a player and it could hurt the Raiders when it comes to a team like the Ravens as I said Lamar Jackson known for getting outside the pocket but uh, I you know Tom Tesco felt like Clavon Chason can get the job done at least for now if he if he's called upon I wouldn't expect much but I I will say it is a hit to the Raiders defensive line just just M Malcolm Kuntz being out just a downgrade from Malcolm Kuntz to Tyree Wilson was already a hit. Now you don't have Tyree Wilson on the field to, to, to develop at his young age in the early stages of his career. It's just not a good situation for the Raiders right now in their defensive line. Right, and maybe I'm guessing, but maybe because of the player they signed, this is a guy with low risk, uh, and, and we don't know how much upside, like you said, because he hasn't really done much after being a first-round draft pick in 2020. Uh, but maybe that says Tyree Wilson, they, they're, they're, they're more confident that Tyree Wilson won't be missing extended time. Now, Tyree Wilson has his own issues to deal with. He needs to up his performance clearly, as we've talked about many times here on the show. But maybe that's a little clue to us that uh, Tom Telesco, because maybe he would have spent more money if you had two guys that were going to be out multiple weeks or four or six weeks, something like that, or Tyree Wilson even worse then perhaps you might have thought about, well, maybe we need to get somebody else who can hang for a little bit more. But clearly, as you said, he's going to spend money where he needs to. But right now, clearly, that's not a spot that he believes he has to. But I do believe that this game, it's a tough game to, to be, be down at that position going into Baltimore. Uh, but like I said, if they can get through that, Mo, and they can show some some ability to control the Ravens as much as they can, then to me, that'll be a big win for that team and from a confidence level, too, on the defensive side. It would be, though, I look, full disclosure, I didn't pick the Raiders to beat the Ravens even before all of this happened. Don't be surprised if the Raiders have issues with Lamar Jackson. Uh, assuming he plays, he missed some practices, and there's some you know, things going on where he you know, may not be 100%. Mm -hmm. But don't let that fool you. Um, Lamar Jackson is still going to be Lamar Jackson, even at less than 100%. And the Raiders may 
may want to use another linebacker to, to spy on him just to help out that defensive line. That's right. All right. Well, listen, we are up against our first break here on this edition of Silver and Black today. By the way, shout out to our friends from BetUS for helping bring this to you, especially on the video side. If you're watching us on YouTube, you're listening to us on the radio, you're listening to us on the podcast or wherever you are. We appreciate you being with us. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the running game. So we're going to go back to the offense, which needs a lot of work. Uh, Alexander Madison popped out a little bit against the Chargers. I know it wasn't spectacular, but it does raise the question, do the Raiders – already need to consider giving Alexander Madison more touches at running back uh, versus Zamir White. We'll talk about that here on Silver and Black today. Mo and Scott coming right back at you after these words. Welcome back to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast heard on K Dawn 101.5 FM and the bet Las Vegas 98.5 HD2. Also, shout out Brought to you by some of our friends, our great friends over at BetUS. Mo Moten, Scott Branson back with you talking Raiders. We talked a lot about the defense in the first segment, talking about the issues at injury as edge as the Raiders head into Baltimore to play this week against the Ravens. And MVP Lamar Jackson, if he's 100%, even if he's not 100%, even if he's 90%, uh, still tough to contain him, especially in the run game. So those are some of the challenges. But Mo, we talked a lot about the Charger loss and, of course, Raider fans very concerned over the offense, as is the rest of the NFL, we saw a couple things. Luke Getze's play calling, meh, okay. We also saw Gardner Minshew, efficient, but not really challenging downfield. Who's to blame? Probably everybody, coaching, player, a little bit of everything involved there. But one of the things, too, that we talked about all offseason, Mo, and, and this is something that, you know, if, if, if we had Mo's Raiders Bible for 2024 <laughs> – in the beginning, the Raiders must have a Raider game, or excuse me, a running game would have been there for you, right? You talked about the need for this offense not having a really dynamic quarterback, whether it was Minshew or O'Connell. These are not highly mobile, dynamic quarterbacks. Minshew a little more than O'Connell is more of a statue, but nonetheless, we knew that. So the Raiders and Antonio Pierce in all of the run-up to the season said, we're going to be a physical team. We're going to smash, smash you in the mouth, both defensively, offensively. So they let Josh Jacobs go to free agency. They then count on Zamir White. Zamir White had some okay looks. He had the fumble in the first game, but we saw Alexander Madison. In fact, on, on Tuesday's show, you talked about him and the ability that he's able to do. This Are we now, though, at the point, and again, small sample size. We're not over-freaking out here, folks. But week two, against this Ravens team, this good defense, this, this, this story defense over the years, for Baltimore, is this a case where we need to see the Raiders, perhaps, and Luke Getze go to much more of the two-headed monster at running back? Don't count on Zamir White to take it all on or the majority of the reps, but actually split it up and and play to the strengths of both of those players. Can we go back to last year when I mentioned that <laughs> Zamir White may not be a workhorse featured mm -hmm. running back? I, oh, yes. I remember – the, the 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 dialogue around Zamir White has changed so much. It started off as, oh, maybe he's not a, a, a feature back, hasn't shown much. Then he has those four weeks last year where he looks like a feature back who can handle 20-plus carries, and everyone goes, oh, you're wrong about Zamir White. Zamir White looks like the lead guy. Now we're back here. It's only one game. Zamir White has that fumble, of course. Can't have a fumble. But he had some decent runs. But my, my point here is that to me, for me, Zamir White was never going to handle the pass catching role on third down. That was never him. He was never, a, to me, even though he didn't do it much at Georgia, doesn't mean he can't do any in the NFL. But he was never a natural pass catcher where he's going to run, you know, actual wide receiver routes or receiver routes and get you a chunk yardage as a pass catcher at the backfield. That's just not his forte. Zamir White, you feed him the ball, he goes downhill, he gets you those extra yards at, at the contact, you would hope, after bulking up. But to me, the third down pass catching role is always for Alexander Madison and or Amir Abdullah, and eventually we would hope they'll allow me. So with Zamir White being the early down ball carrier, that's fine. He he can maintain that role. I don't think they need to cut down on his uh, snaps or his touches or anything like that because that's supposed to be his position role. You know, right. first to second down, run downhill. With with Alexander Madison coming in, he can give you a little bit of a spark possibly in the short passing game, spells Zamir White as Zamir White doesn't have the hot hand because I believe that's what Antonio Pierce said about the run game and the mm. two running backs, that they're going to feed the hot hand, whether it's Zamir White or Alexander Madison. 
Right. And I think with Madison, the question I have for you too, and, and I want to discuss is you, to your point about being the receiving back there, because, because right, Zamir White, the game, two receptions, two yards, uh, Alexander Madison had four receptions, 43 yards. He was targeted six times, which is as many as Devonte Adams, by the way. But, but I look at that and six is not bad for a running back, but I wonder if going into this Baltimore game, and this goes back to, of course, Luke Getze again, but, but does he deserve more opportunities, perhaps not just on third down, but in other, other sets so that, because it obviously worked. He had 43 yards receiving uh, against the Chargers. And, 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 and to me, it's like, okay, if you're not going to be able to run the ball, because Zamir White, if he's going to get 15, 20 carries, great. But if he's not the guy who's going to get you over four yards a carry, let's say, and he just can't establish that, then, then do you think about just doing things differently and going to the pass to the running back, which is, yeah, I know people want to go vertical, but if it was working now, that's against the Chargers. Against the Ravens, I don't know. I don't know enough about the defense to know how they they handled the plays like that in those sets. But but Mo, it, 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 I'm just wondering if they need to find ways to get him involved more uh, in that passing game as well. Well, it depends on the game flow. If he's giving you those big gains, then yeah, you, you give more opportunities like you saw against the Chargers. But if it's not if it's not working or if it's if he's just not giving you yeah, those you don't force it, right? Right. So yeah. it, it goes back to my point about the hot hand, even with when it comes to feeding Alexander Madison the ball on short passing uh situations that you don't want to force anything. Whatever's whatever's working, you continue to work with it because if the defense is not defending the running back well out of the backfield as a pass catcher, then that's something you want to exploit. We saw last Thursday with Roquan Smith, the Chiefs picked on him, but with a t with a tight end, Isaiah Likely. Now you can put a running back out there if he's good enough to get to the middle of the field and, and exploit that linebacker in coverage. But the Raiders have to at least consider uh, using using Alexander, Alexander Madison a little bit more if they're able to get those explosive gains. Because as I said last week, the Raiders right now are boomer bust offense where they're going to have some stall drives where they're going to go three and out. And they have the playmakers where they can they can get a 50 yard or Trey Tucker. I want to see more passes downfield. We'll talk about that too. But they have the playmakers where they can get those big plays. It's just a matter of execution, play calling, and putting those players in position to get those big games. Absolutely. And I also the, the other thing here too is I I would really love to see, and this goes back to the offensive uh kind of creativity question we had earlier in the week, which is I would love to see Luke Getze, because we saw it, I think one or two times. But I want to see Brock Bauer set up on those third downs in the running back position, too, and coming out of there. He did a lot in college. We talked way back at the draft when he was drafted about what his versatility is. So I'd like to see more of that, too. So, you know, yes, I think you got to balance the, 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 the opportunity for, wait a minute, you got Brock Bauer's in the backfield. Well, clearly they think it's going to be a, a passing play. But, you, again, you're going to maybe get him into one-on-one -on -one situations in, in, a, in a five yards or a seven, eight yards or in situation, especially when you need a first down and be able to go to him. Yeah. The thing with Brock Bowers is if you're going to use him to at, at that value, mm -hmm. uh, you got, you got to be creative with him because they, he led the team in targets against the charge. Yeah. Eight targets, I believe. And when you have a Brock Bowers, you want to be careful not to ignore some of your other playmakers. And Brock Bowers is great in what he could do, but just remember you have, Devontae Adams, who only had six, what, six targets in against the Chargers. Yeah. You have Trey Tucker, who I just mentioned for the deep uh, deep passes. You have Jacoby Myers. And another secret weapon I think the Raiders should use, Tyreek McAllister. A caller had uh, was on air last week and said, hey, why is Tyreek McAllister listed as a wide receiver? That's not really his natural position. And I said they can use him in a variety of different ways. Uh, DJ Turner as well fits into this. If you want those explosive plays, if you want to go into your bag of tricks, now is the time to do it against the Baltimore Ravens. Well, I would say this, Mo, and, and I want to ask you this question. We have about 30 seconds left here in the segment before we get to our third segment, which is the Raider Nation mailbag. We're going to take your calls. Uh, we want to give enough time to get those calls in. Is, uh, is this team, is this Raiders team going to be able to run the ball? We saw what happened with the Chargers, who had a pretty good defensive front. Do you think they're going to be able to establish that run against this Baltimore defense? during this game i don't think the baltimore defense is what it was with mike mcdonald who's now the head coach of the seattle seahawks mm -hmm. uh I, I would say you have to at least try based on what i've seen out of the raiders offensive line though 
it's going to be tough because the offensive line has to get a push up front in order for that run game to uh, be able to produce. And it's, it's a wait and see type of thing with the offensive line. Yeah, there you go. All right. We're going to take our second break here on Silver and Black today. Heard on the radio on 101.5 KDON FM in Las Vegas, as well as 98.5 The Bet HD2. Also, Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. By the way, if you don't already subscribe to the podcast, what are you doing? Yes, you can. If you're listening to us on the radio on Sunday in Las Vegas, thank you. But listen to the podcast the rest of the week, wherever you get your audio rate and review as well. We appreciate that, too, as we do appreciate our folks at BetUS for helping us bring this show to you. All right. When we come back. We're getting to your calls with Mo and Scott here on Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. Enough of hearing us talk about the Raiders. It's time to hear from, from you. Many Oakland Raider fan, Las Vegas Raider fan. Stand up. On this edition of the Raider Nation Mailbag. Got a black hole rock and rolling. Don't be a wallflower. Be a part of the show. Leave your question or message by calling 702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869. Or drop us an email at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. All right. There you go. We are on our way as we cruise along here in the rest of the show. Of course, this is your show now. This is the Silver and Black Today Raider Nation mailbag. We appreciate you guys uh, being with us. Mo Moten, Scott Branson. If you don't follow Mo on X, do so. Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. The show is SNB today. All right, Mo, we got lots of great calls. We got some texts to get to today. Uh, we're still hearing some people talk about, of course, the game uh, against the Chargers, but also looking for it. So here we go. First caller up is our good friend. We're starting right with him off the top. Jacob from Fresno. Yeah. Golly, golly, golly. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? Uh, I'm going to be the bearer of bad news today. And uh, depending on how the season goes, I just might have to be the bearer of bad news over a week. We'll see. We'll see how it works. But I want to throw some uh, some paper at you, some some numbers, some statistics that the guy with the glasses in the back, he brought them to me, and he said, <laughs> hey, I'll just share this with Scott and Owen. So, hey, hey, according to that dude, let me tell you what he said. The teams traditionally, historically, rather – in the NFL that start all and one immediately at that point have a 20 to 30% chance of making the playoffs. Mm. That's a lot more. That is shocking to me. Honestly, I had no idea, but it just goes to show you how important it is to start your season. Correct. Obviously it doesn't mean you're not going to make the playoffs. It just means that your likelihood of making the playoffs has significantly dipped because your first opportunity to get ahead, you didn't. Now, here's an even worse one, right? So follow me here. The likelihood of making the playoffs after starting 0-2, which a lot of us are <laughs> predicting, you know, with the Baltimore Ravens going mm. all the way to Baltimore, that percentage, the likelihood of going to the playoffs, is 11 to 12%. Now, that is extremely significant. And, I mean, if you're just going by the paper, you know, you're going by what the guy in the back tells you. You're just not going to make the playoffs when you go on, too. Now, we know, well, I know, because the guy with the paper told me, the guy with the glasses, he said the first team to win the Super Bowl going 0-2 was the 1993 Dallas Cowboys. I don't know who the second team was, <laughs> but I do know that Antonio Pierce's 2007 New York Giants also did it. So, if yeah. we get in that predicament, at least we got somebody who's been there, right? Yeah. That's something to fall back on. <laughs> I'm really not looking forward to this season now, guys. You take it easy. Go crazy. All right, there's Jacob. Minus the kids this time. No screaming kids in the background. And I can relate to that, man, because <laughs> I got five as well. They're not little anymore. But anyway, Mo, uh, good point there. I mean, listen, you and I didn't really think that this team would be a playoff team. We said they could possibly win a couple if they won a couple games here and there that they're not supposed to. So that's not surprising to me. And he's right. 0-2 means 11% chance. There's been 265 teams that started 0-2 since 1990. And 30 of those teams made it to the playoffs, including the 2022 Cincinnati Bengals, of course. But uh, yeah, I mean, 
look, you got in the NFL starting off fast is a huge deal. Absolutely huge deal. I would say that with the 0 and 2 record statistic, I would look at it from 2021 and beyond because in 2021, that's when the 17th game was added. So the numbers are going to be very different um, and positive toward 0 and 2 teams because of that extra game. Uh, I, I can tell you a team offhand, and the Raiders aren't uh, comparable to this team because of the talent, talent gap, but the Cincinnati Bengals started off 0 and 2, and I believe 2022, and they went 12 and 4. Yep. Now the Cincinnati Bengals are great. They got a they got a franchise quarterback. Totally different story. But my point here is that it's still a long season. Even if, like I said, if the Raiders lose this game, and I and I think they will, <laughs> it's still for me not the end of the world in terms of what they can still do. They, Panthers in the home opener. The Cleveland Browns don't look great. I've been saying it over and over again. Deshaun Watts is not the same player. And there are people who still refuse to believe it. The Raiders have the Cleveland Browns in week four. So yeah. let's say the Raiders do start off 0 and 2. And we take Jacob's statistics 11% or, or whatever the percentage is after 2021 when the 17th game was added. If the Raiders then come back and then win two games, Carolina and Cleveland, does the narrative then change? Are you back on board thinking, okay, the Raiders have a chance to win 10 games? Now, I will tell you this, my friend, because, you know, you, you, you are a font of football information. Everybody knows how great you cover football. And I'm not just, I'm not just you know, throwing flowers at you to, 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 to make you feel good. It's true. But since, uh, since 2021, the percentage has gone up a little bit, right? But it's not significant. It's up to about 14%. So, so, but, but it's still, you're right. It's, it changed with the number of games and all that stuff. And you brought out some good examples of teams that were able to do it. And uh, you talked about Cincinnati and even Cincinnati uh, last year ahead, then not lost their quarterback. They, they were actually pretty close still as were a couple other teams uh, there too. So, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but I get it. You know, you get, you get down if you get down 0 and 2 and it's, it's tough. That's why you got to start off start. It's so very important. All right. We're going out now. We're staying in Fresno. We got another caller from Fresno. He's apparently not a, not associated with Jacob at all, but here's Caesar. Hey Scott, hey Mo, this is Caesar calling out of Fresno. A uh, long time, first time. Uh, no relation to Jacob, although you know he seems like a cool dude. So shouts out to him. <laughs> uh, I'm just calling to say, um, can we all just relax a little bit? Like I get it. You know, I am not happy with, you know, a lot of what I saw on the field yesterday, especially from the offense. I get that, you know, maybe this is just pent up frustration. It's been over 20 years of, you know, being told repeatedly, you know, things are going to get better. Maybe there's a little bit too much hype this off season and we we're disillusioned by what we saw. Um, but still, we need to chill out just a little bit. I mean, I'm seeing some crazy stuff on the internet. I'm seeing people say, you know, I think the Raiders might have the worst offense in the NFL. I'm seeing people say, you know, AP made terrible decisions. We need to get rid of him. I ain't said off somebody say, you know, what's up with Daniel Carlson? He seems to be missing more. <laughs> uh, do we need to look into getting another kicker? Like, are you kidding me? Like, no, like, relax. Like, I get it. I'm, I am not defending at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we saw on the field yesterday it wasn't good it was not good um you know that was not a good game uh but it is week one we need to relax a little bit because you know what the, the thing i hate more than a raiders loss is social media after a raiders <laughs> loss because some fans can are just insufferable and negative and like i i i, I don't understand like it, it just makes everything worse. I expect that from, you know, fans of other teams, not from our own. So I'm just saying, can we all take like a chill pill? You know, no, it was not good. And I'm not making any excuses, but you know what? I'm moving on to the next game. Do we have, uh, you know, any chance against the Ravens? I don't know who's to say NFL is crazy. Crazier things have happened. Um, you know, we, we've been in Lamar Jackson before when I think I, we had a chance. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying, you know, we're going to go 16 and 0 from here on out win the Super Bowl. I'm just saying, you know, let's all chill, watch the game, have a good time and, you know, take it one game at a time. Anywho, uh, Scott, Mo, thank you for all you guys, everything you guys do. You guys put on a hell of a show. I appreciate it. 
And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> His phone said, you're welcome. I love it. But thank you. We appreciate that, Caesar. And call in again, your first call here at the show. I appreciate that very much from Fresno, California as well. And yeah, week one overreaction happens every year, uh, just like it happens in preseason as well. The regular season is no different. There's some real issues you should worry about. But yeah, don't don't start thinking the season's over already after one week. Caesar, I got one bit of advice for you. If you're listening, Caesar, listen to me very closely. I had to take this advice myself. Just stay off Twitter, social after. media after losses because you you see all there were there were a group of fire AP folks on Twitter after the loss, and and we criticized AP for the punt. But I mean, come on now, we're one game into the season, and we and we said that the inexperience would show at times, and you're gonna have to be patient yeah. with it. And I know the patient, the P word for Raiders. Is, is is not well taken because they've been patient for like two decades now. I understand yeah. it. I totally get it. But when you hire a head coach without much experience, right, you have to expect some bumps in the road. And as Caesar said, it's one game. And I believe I said this on my Bleach Report Live. I said this on this show. While it didn't look good, 10 points isn't great. I understand that. The people that just want to bench everyone and fire everyone after after one loss going on one, it, it's it's social media fodder. And yeah. I, again, anyone, not just Caesar, if anyone is listening to me right now, just stay on social media after losses. <laughs> I mean, if you want to get on social media, fine and and absorb all of that stuff, but um, don't engage because it's just it's just it's a few more exercise. It. There's a lot of emotions going on. Yeah, and I can tell from Caesar's uh, tone on the phone. He's, he's a positive type of guy, yeah. so he's not going to get lost in that. So thanks for the call, Caesar. Again, call back real soon. All right, now we got a text message. We're going out to Vic Romero in Los Angeles. Vic says, hey, guys, I know you don't want to hear or talk about Carr, but our struggles uh -huh. this season boils down to just that. Us getting rid of him and not drafting a QB last year was a catastrophic mistake and will set us back for years. No one wants to hear this, including myself, but we need to trade some guys and tank I won't sit here and tell you who to trade because I don't make the big bucks like Telesco makes. But case scenario, let's just say we sneak into the playoffs. We still won't have a legitimate contender. We still won't be legitimate contenders with either Minshew or AOC. And if that does happen, we're stuck with another quarterback or another year not being able to get a quarterback. I understand this is only one week, but the writing is on the wall. As much as I pray every night that Minshew somehow turns into Kenny Stabler or AOC <laughs> becomes the second coming of Tom Brady, we all know in our gut that's not going to happen. Love the show, guys. And by the way, my 97-year-old grandma is still faster than Tyree Wilson. There we go. <laughs> Vic Romero in Los Angeles. You bring up some good points there. I, I, again, I'm not I'm not as catastrophic, uh, or I shouldn't say as, as fatalistic as you are, Vic, on this team yet. But I will tell you, the quarterback situation Mo and I have been talking about for two years. They tried. They tried this year to do it they could not do it there were too many teams that's the other thing is no matter how much you want to do something there are other teams who want to do it too and are you willing to and do you have the capital to move up and do it and you might say well they should have given anything they could have get to give up there well other teams had more so it's not always a, a, a zero-sum game there and so the Raiders I think they tried to now why didn't they address it two three years ago different story but last year I don't fault them Mo uh, real quickly, I don't, I don't, I don't see how they could have been out of the position. But I do agree with him. If they, if they somehow were a borderline playoff team and they're 15, 16 in the draft, yeah, then you might be in the same position. But maybe this year, with some of what's going on, they have the ability to move up. Even if the Raiders finish somewhere where they have pick a pick in the teens somewhere, let's say the Raiders finish somewhere between you know six and eleven and eight and nine, which is our prediction at eight and nine, right? That means they're going to get a pick out, maybe possibly outside the top 10. Now, if it's 6-11, they may get like the ninth or 10th pick. But being being a mediocre team doesn't doesn't uh, shut them out of getting a quarterback if Tom Telesco is willing to be aggressive. Right. Look at what the Minnesota Vikings did this past offseason. The Minnesota Vikings moved up. They were, I believe they finished 7-10 and 10 last year. And what did they do? They moved up, and they wound up with J.J. McCarthy. So, yeah. you know, it's not it's not a situation where, OK, whatever the Raiders draft pick is, they have to stay put. Tom Telesco has to look at his roster and say, as we all saw, A. A. O'Connell or Gardner Minshew ain't it. 
and we have to be more aggressive to get a quarterback. Now, Dak Prescott has re-signed with the Dallas Cowboys, so that conversation is now off the table. And you know, if you're looking at the draft, you're hoping that that the same number of teams that needed a quarterback this year won't need a quarterback next year. So it leaves the possibility right. open for a trade-up. Right. And But then you look at some of the teams who did take quarterbacks this year mm -hmm. or in the last few years that are still in the – I mean, we talk about the Carolina Panthers will be in Las Vegas in two weeks. If, if they decide after two years Bryce Young ain't it, they're going to be in the first two or three picks. So guess what? <laughs> You have another team and he's a quarterback. You have Atlanta. Who knows what happens with Kirk Cousins? I know they signed the big deal, and I know they have Penix behind them. You just you just don't know what's going to happen. Crazy things happen in in the in with the Packers too. I mean, they're going to be a pretty good team, I think. But they they need a quarterback, perhaps if Jordan Love. Who knows what's going to come back? So you just don't know what's going to happen, and so we'll see. But great call, uh, great text, Vic. We appreciate you call or uh, sending in, and you can do that seven zero two nine hundred seven eight six nine. All right, we'll quickly move to Misha in Orange County, Misha. Yeah. Guy, what's up, Mo? Uh, also, what's up, to Mert? Uh, this is Misha from mm -hmm. OC. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty disappointing loss. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, our, our, our run defense and, you know, the decision by Coach Pierce to not go for it on fourth down. And, you know, although I, I do agree that. It, I, if it was me, I would have definitely went for it. Um, but, but, you know, at the same time, I'm going to give a, a lot of pushback on, on some of this because, you know, here, here's the thing. We, first of all, the run defense, uh, let's just not even go there. Our, our defense has been our only saving grace. Um, and they, they played their asses off uh, throughout the, most, the majority of the game. You know, the, we just, we just don't do anything on offense. And I don't know how many times, you know, the defense has to, has to go out there and bail, bail out the offense. It's the, it's the same song and dance from last season. I mean, last season, the, the, the defense held up their end of the bargain. Offense, <laughs> didn't squat. So, you know, I, I, I just think that with the personnel that we have, as good as it's going to get, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I mean, you know, Samir White, Madison, although I, I, I was very impressed with Madison, and these guys aren't going to turn into very freaking Sanders overnight. Um, and, you know, the, the decision on fourth down, I mean, I think we're hyper-focusing on, on that one thing. If you look at the totality of the game, you know, we had plenty of opportunities on offense to put this game away considering how well our defense played and we just couldn't do it. So I, I'm pushing back on, on giving Antonio Pierce, you know, a lot of heat for this, even though I did disagree with the decision, but much love guys. Appreciate your time. All right. There you go. Misha. And, and I agree. I mean, look, uh, it is what it is there, but but look, they have an opportunity. Also, that's where I say not to get too freaked out. Like the offensive line can play better. It can. It's going to get Jackson Powers Johnson at some point, and and that can improve over time. They've improved on offensive line over the year. Last year they struggled a little bit. Now they struggle a little bit against the Chargers, a good team too. Nobody gives credit for the tandem that the Chargers had. You go up against good players. It's not as easy. So I think that uh, before you freak out on that stuff, I think we got to give it a few weeks. Got to get a bigger sampler size. All right, Misha, thank you so much. Now we're going out, Mo, to South Florida, South Florida Raider. Hey, this is South Florida Raider down in Miami. What's up, Scott? What's up, Mo? Uh, calling on this Raider loss, man. Uh, watching this game made me feel like maybe we missed an opportunity with Bo Hardigree. He sure had the offense playing well at the end of last year. On Sunday, they did not look that promising. Uh, the other thing is, I feel like this this offense doesn't fit our defense. We need to be able to run the ball. Nothing in Luke Getzky's formations tells me that we're going to be able to run the ball this season successfully. And if we're not able to run the ball, I feel like it's going to be a long season, man. Um, the other thing is that it also hurts to see Jim Harbaugh on the opposing sideline. Knowing that we had a chance to get this guy and watching him just run the ball down our throats, letting us know from a power eye formation that he was going to run the ball, but successfully doing it hurts, man. 
Uh, he's, that's the definition of smash mouth football. Anyhow, love y'all show, man. Uh, keep up the good work. South Florida Raider out. All right. South Florida Raider. Thanks, man. Mo, his point on the running game. As I said in the earlier segment, it starts up front with the offensive line. The Raiders have to get better up front. Cody Whitehair was not good in that first game. I don't know if, if he improves or not, because remember, he is past his prime. Or is Jackson Powers Johnson going to start sooner than later? We'll find out. But um, you're absolutely right. With this defense, um, South Florida Raiders, the Raiders have to be able to run the ball effectively. We talked about Alexander Madison earlier in the show. If he could provide a spark, uh, Zamir White, more of a downhill runner. Uh, if, if Madison can get you those chunk yardage plays, and, and as I said, the Reds could be a boom bust offense, uh, that's what they have to do. But um, there has to be some balance, too. And Luke Getze had a – let's remember Luke Getze had a Justin Fields to help with the run game in Chicago. So if people want to point to the Bears' run game numbers in Chicago, just remember Justin Fields was a big part of that. Gardner Minshew is mobile, but he's not Justin Fields on his yeah. feet. Uh, so the Raiders are going to have to find a way to manufacture yards on the ground with their running backs with the offensive line playing a lot better, hopefully. South Florida Raider, thanks for the call. All right, quick text here. Uh, we got a few minutes left here to get to text and some calls. It is Jay from Pennsylvania. He says, hey, guys, love the show. Just wanted to say it can't be an overreaction when you set realistic expectations. Very good point. First-time head coach with two years' experience as a coach in the NFL fails to get the first and second choice for OC and settles for Getze. Comes into the season with two backup quarterbacks competing and expecting more. I'm not sure where this goes, but it's fitting. Harbaugh <laughs> comes in and hands AP his first loss as head coach. Again, that's from Jay in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I think this is what we said when we did our record prediction, Mo. is like, he's going to make mistakes. Uh, we don't know about Getze. It's a big unknown. And you don't have the quarterback position figured out yet. So temper your expectations. So I think a lot of people are overlooking too, and that's a good good text, by the way. Um, great points there. And you look at coaching, and speaking of coaching and adjustments, the Chargers often struggle throughout the first half, right? Mm -hmm. They come out the second half, what happens? They, they go down, they, they kick a field goal, they have to punt, touchdown, and then another punt. So stagnant in the first half of the Chargers offense, they make adjustments, they come out, the Raiders defense starts to unravel with those adjustments the Chargers made, and it all goes to coaching. And I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, Antonio Pierce got, you know, outclassed, but it's clear that the Chargers coaching staff with Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh being experienced coaches knew what they were doing, made the adjustments, and it was effective because then the, like J.K. Dobbins breaks out, as, as we talked about, defense unravels late third quarter going into the fourth quarter. And the Chargers come away, with, come away with the game. You would hope that this young coaching staff led by Pierce and Luke Getze gets better, not worse. All right, we got time for one more call. A couple minutes left. We're going with NorCal Raider. Here's NorCal Raider. Hey, uh, Mo. Um, how's it going? This is uh, NorCal Raider. Um, I'm just kind of just my thoughts on the, on the game this weekend. You know, I don't really have a lot of thoughts with the game. I'm, I'm kind of upset with the way they played. Um, you know, the most important thing, the the most important thing with um with uh um, the team is the quarterback and I feel like the quarterback's gonna be it's gonna hinder the team badly. Um, you know, that that's why I was very uh very very uh overstating this uh, off season that they would trade Devontae. And what's happening now is Devontae's not looking so good and now we're gonna get a worse pick because of it. Because if they end up trading him, which they more likely are gonna trade him. Just, I mean, it, it's a given, you know. I would have preferred playing the way we did with the rookie quarterback than you know, the way we played yesterday um, or Sunday. Um, you know, because I understand, you know, it's it appears only got a two-year deal. But at the end of the day, they allowed John Gruden to play mediocre for many years. Why can't they do the same thing with uh, Antonio Pierce? If, if you're going to try to grow and build, you don't build by taking away the team and just getting rid of it after one bad season or something. I bet Audi. So this is this is a this is a, a knock on Mark Davis because I remember a few years back when we had him <clears throat> with uh, Jack Del Rio, he got rid of him after the, after he resigned him. So it makes no sense. You know, we had one bad season. I think we were like six and ten that year, and he got rid of him. I don't understand what's going on. You know, the only way you're going to build with this team and grow is is is, is keep a foundation together for many years. But um, mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'm just overreacting. I'm hope I'm hopeful. Um, you know, we need a we need a good season. We need at least a five hundred season and at least possible wild card. So 
I mean, it's a lot of football left. Um, hopefully, they pick up the running game. And our offensive line was also um, an issue, too. So um, that's all I got to say. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, there you go. NorCal Raider. Mo, we got about 20 seconds uh, to his point there. Uh, it's a basic point. Not a basic point. It's the general point of what we had today's show. Uh, don't freak out too much over one game. We know it didn't look good, but there's still a lot of season left. It, there's so much that could happen over the course of three to four months. So just hang in there, Raider Nation. Yeah, Raider Nation. Have some optimism. I know it's been a tough couple decades, but... Just hang in there. We'll see how it goes. Let's get through four weeks, five weeks, and then I think we'll have a better yeah. sense for where this team is at. So I wouldn't get too far. I know you're passionate, so I get it. I, you got to be emotional because you you love your team. Uh, so I get that. But all right, Mo, we're out of time already, man. It went quick. Appreciate all the calls. And, of course, we'll have more on the next show. Mo, my friend, enjoy the weekend coming up. Uh, and anything you want to shout out real quick in about 10 seconds? Uh. TNT Sports Tonight with Coy Wire talking NFL topics around the league. I will be on post game after the Raiders and Ravens, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. See you then, Raider Nation, over at Bleach Report Live. All right. Yes, you will. And we will see you after the game as well. Myself and Murph, voice of the fan. So we appreciate you guys being with us. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your audio. And to our radio listeners, thanks for tuning in. And for our video listeners, watchers, viewers, Thanks again for all the chat and the great stuff. For Mo Moten, for our producer, Mike Rabier, and our executive producer on the radio, Mark Bonilla, I am Scott Cobranson. We'll see you later, Raider Nation. Enjoy the game on Sunday.